in everyone. Uh, so there, there are four leads, and I'm, I, I don't think any of us responsible for welcome slides. So I, I didn't have a speech <laughs> for welcome. So I'll just jump straight to uh, the part I'm going to talk about. And okay, uh, let me try to fix it. So first, I will introduce myself. So I'm Alex, and I work mostly on Argo CD. I've been working on the project for like five years. Um, uh, I guess that's why I'm uh, representing the project today. And I will cover um, project state um, as of today. I will talk about what was uh, what we're going to release in like hopefully next week or week after next week. And I will cover a few roadmap items. <clears throat> and so the first slide is uh, just a summary of current project state. So uh, as you can see, we've uh, basically the project is you know keep keep driving. So we keep getting uh, GitHub stars and gigs stars itself they don't uh, matter much but it's a good indication of how healthy the project is and uh, how many people it's attracting and so in this year we've got uh, 3000 stars and it make it basically project finally bypassed the 10000 uh, star 10000 thousands sorry, 10k stars mark and i think it was it was really exciting for everyone who work on the project uh, and uh, I think even better indication is how many people, better indication of project popularity is how many people are contributing. And so uh, we've got uh, around 3,000 contributors, contributions uh, since beginning of this year. And that includes commits and bug reports uh, from almost 400 uh, people. And uh, it's awesome uh, because that really proves that project is doing uh, very well. Uh, and the result of all this activity uh, are features and actual code and documentation changes. And so um, we've observed it through like since maybe like three years ago that project is moving forward very consistently. We are literally getting uh, around 100 uh, commits every month and this year is no different. So uh, to this point, to this uh, month, we've got around uh, 900 commits as usual uh, i mean for like a, that's the usual number for like nine months um, of work and uh, project also releasing uh, publishing new releases around every three months and uh, this is still happening so we've published two releases 2.3 and 2.4 uh, and uh, 2.5 is delayed but it's also a very common thing so we delay release by like Two, three weeks usually and uh, 2.5 is uh, coming i think it was supposed to be released uh, maybe a week ago but we're still working on last minute uh, bug fixes and finishing uh, some feature polishing but basically it will be uh, released hopefully soon uh, and uh, i wanted to give you a little like just describe you of what's coming in uh, 2.5 release and i will walk quickly through features and I think because it's there is four of us, maybe it doesn't make sense to ask questions now, but I'm pretty sure we will have time after this talk to answer questions. So I'm just proposing to ask, if you have any particular questions about those features, ask it when all four presenters uh, present. Uh, all right, and so uh, 2.5 uh, features. So the first one, I think the most anticipated feature for the last year is uh, multi-sources support. Uh, and I'm hoping everyone know what source means in Argo CD. If not, I will just quickly repeat. Uh, so Argo CD has a CRD called application. Application has a source and destination. Destination is a Kubernetes cluster and namespace. And source is a Git repository or Helm repository. And so uh, it worked perfectly fine for most of the use cases. But there are several important use cases uh, where users want to specify not just one repo, but many repositories. And the most prominent use case is um, if you have a Helm chart that you cannot control, uh, so-called off-the-shelf Helm chart that's maintained by some community, and you have your own values that you want to use to generate manifests out of the Helm chart. And this is the most common use case. So as of 2.5, you will be able to take your health chart, uh, Helm chart, don't modify it, and then connect kind of your private Git repository with the values that are specific for your environment. 
and you won't have to create a Git repository just to combine the Helm chart and, and the value files. So, and this uh, feature, it's to be honest, not yet merged, but the pull request has been open for like a month. It got a very healthy, like the a review and uh, bug fixes process is going very actively and it has a really good chance to make it most likely it, it will be there. Um, okay, as I said, like no questions, I guess, for features right now. So I can just move on to the next feature. Uh, next is uh, server side applied. That's maybe not the most visible feature. Like you won't see a much of changes in the user interface, but it's a, a very important feature. It's a, I would say it's a quality improvement uh, feature. So server side apply refers to Kubernetes server side apply. If you don't know, there are two type of uh, ways to push changes into Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and if you use Kubernetes, you basically use one of those ways uh, when you work with kubectl. And so client side apply requires a lot of calculations to be done on, on the client side. Client side. And sometimes those calculations may be not accurate. And another bad side effect, uh, basically the object that you modify have to carry a heavy metadata information. And what it's bad, it's not great because sometimes you want to modify a very large object such as custom resource definition or a config map that has a lot of data and the metadata basically supposed to include the whole object. So that means you have to store data in your Kubernetes cluster unnecessary. And sometimes you cannot even, basically the limit of your object, uh, the total size of the object is one megabyte. And if you reserve a half of the size to metadata, that leaves you only 500 kilobytes, which is not enough. And basically server side apply resolve those limitations. You no longer need to carry that uh, much of metadata and you can store more in Kubernetes cluster. So an Argo CD finally supports uh, this way of modifying objects in Kubernetes. Um, yeah, so that's actually, it will really improve performance of the Argo CD itself and the cluster that it manages. Okay, uh, the next feature is uh, another feature that's maybe not, you're not, as an end user, you're not going to see uh, much of it, but if you are operator who run Argo CD, you might really like it. So this uh, feature let Argo CD uh, to serve Argo CD application definitions in multiple namespaces as opposed to single uh, Argo CD namespace. And so what that means is you can now uh, install Argo CD into the managed cluster and then don't give access uh, to Argo CD itself to your end users. And instead you can tell them, just create application in the namespace that you have access to. And that's one of the use cases that uh, this uh, feature solves. Before the end user must have created application only in Argo CD namespace. And that makes a lot of, uh, introduces a lot of requirements. You must trust that user, you must Basically, the user has to be administrator. So uh, this support of multiple namespaces, your end users can create applications using kubectl, and they don't have to be administrators, and they are protected. They won't be able to shoot themselves in the foot because, because of how this feature is implemented. And we can talk about details later, I guess. Um, all right. Uh, I didn't tell us before I started talking about this slide, how many major features we have in 2.5. <laughs> but um, yeah, the next uh, feature, it's another long time anticipated uh, improvement. Uh, that ability to manage application sets in Argo CD using Argo CD API and CLI. Uh, and the quick for the context application set is a, another CRG in Argo CD world that automate creation of uh, Argo CD applications. And because it was meant for Argo CD administrators, first it was only available as a custom resource that you have to manage in a cluster itself. So you must be an admin to create, you know, to, to be able to create application set or modify it. And uh, we kind of 
we in intended to expose it to end users. And that feature is a first step. So uh, we've now created API and CLI uh, that uses the API to, to create and delete and modify application sets. And the next step is to introduce user interface. And this is planned for 2.6 release and 2.5 only got API and CLI. Uh, and then finally, a feature that you're going to see for sure. So it's actually a set of enhancements in the main uh, web page that all Argo CD users uh, frequently use. So we have uh, application details page, which is a page that visualizes application state and provide users controls to control the application. And so there are a bunch of improvements. And I'm, I just, I think I listed like top three that I noticed, but there are more. Um, and so basically the, the one is, uh, there are kind of a new set of ways how you can uh, group our uh, Argo CD application resources. And uh, I won't describe all the details of grouping, but the idea that Kubernetes applications might include hundreds of objects. And the first version of Argo CD was just showing all the objects in form of a tree. And sometimes it's just, impossible to make sense of, out of the tree because of there are too many objects uh, in the page. But those objects, they have different kind of relationship. And one example is, uh, let's say in a network view, you could see uh, object service and all the ports that the service sent traffic to. And in 2.5 version, you have a, a way, you basically you get a button called group. If you click that button, uh, instead of a tree, you will get a services representation that kind of wrap all the ports they send traffic to. And what it makes, suddenly you get the same amount of data visualized on the page, but it takes way less space, way less space, and it's much easier to understand, uh, you know, what, what's happening on the page. Um, okay, and there is one last feature that I wanted to cover. I don't think it's the biggest one, but I just know it because I, I worked on it as well. <laughs> and uh, basically, we, Argo CD has a way to authenticate uh, access to uh, EKS clusters, clusters that uh, you know uh, Amazon runs. And for a long time, people were asking for the same feature, but for GKE clusters, for Google clusters. And finally, they, it's possible now. So you no longer have to kind of package any kind of bash script into your uh, container to access GKE clusters. Now you can just craft a secret that represents a cluster and you just need to specify a couple parameters that points Argo CD to your GKE cluster and it will handle the authentication logic to generate the token. And this is it. That's, uh, okay, that's all about 2.5 release. Um, yeah, and I'm pretty sure there are way more features that, uh, you might be curious about and feel free to ask uh, after the presentation. I almost forgot I had one more slide. So the roadmap slide. And this is, again, it's like heavily, I chose features that I think are important. And there are a bunch of maintainers here in that room. And <clears throat> I'm pretty sure we have uh, other features on the roadmap that uh, maybe can even make it quicker than the features that on that slide. but. Uh, Feel free to ask questions about these features after. And so uh, what I believe is kind of on roadmap and will be most likely part of 2.6 release uh, is uh, application sets in a user interface. Uh, so we just made it, we just created CLI and API. So it just makes sense to kind of continue and finally build the user interface for application sets. Uh, another feature that actually it's been in development in 2.4 and 2.5 release so the config management plugins enhancement feature. And what that feature brings is uh, ability to expose any config management tool such as Customize or Helm or uh, Grafana Tanka and so on uh, in form of a plugin. And, uh, but so you basically you should be able to connect the tool just by making some config changes but what the end user get looks like a first class support. And this is what this feature is about. So far we, I think we almost done with most of backend changes to make it possible. And in next release, I hope we will finally leverage the backend changes 
in Argo CD UI, and finally deliver the feature. Um, yeah, so, um, and next uh, enhancement, it's uh, a merge of Argo CD image updater into Argo CD itself. Uh, and so probably you know what image updater is. Uh, if not, that I will give you a quick summary. Basically, it's a tool that lets you connect your Docker registry uh, and teach Argo CD to automatically upgrade images every time when a new image is pushed into Docker registry. And the, this little sentence I wrote, uh, basically what it gives you is, it's like a seamless CI CD integration without scripting. So without that tool, you usually have to write uh, a Jenkins step or GitHub action a script that updates a deployment repository. And it's such a common use case. So image updater just automates it. And it's been available, the project uh, has been available for like a couple of years already. It's definitely stable. People use it in production. And finally, the you know, maintainers of that project propose to just merge it into Argo CD, make it available to everyone. Uh, and everyone agreed. So basically, there are people who already committed to work on it. Hopefully, it will make it into next release. Uh, and then last couple of features that I found in our roadmap, I know that it has a lot of uh, user requests. And basically, I use this meeting to remind all the maintainers about those two features. <clears throat> so one is ability to specify secrets in Argo CD parameters. And this is the, I think it's like, Maybe the most one of the most famous features from among end users, uh, because it kind of brings secret management into Argo CD. At the same time, maintainers didn't want to commit to build it uh, because uh, it's like a huge chunk of work to uh, introduce secret management. Uh, and then I think we kind of in the contributors meeting discussions we agreed to uh, build a compromise. So <clears throat> there is a we want to let users manage secrets in Kubernetes uh, secrets and just reference them in Argo CD parameters. So it's a good compromise, basically allows end users to connect secret management solution that they want, uh, and then just leverage secrets in Argo CD and hopefully it will solve the final use case. You know, end users will be able to use secrets to generate uh, Kubernetes manifests without scripting. And then uh, finally, another feature that um, can help a lot of CRD, basically Kubernetes uh, project maintainers. So ability to specify parent-child relationship between uh, objects. And the best example is, uh, I guess, maybe Argo CD itself. So in Kubernetes, there is a native way to specify which object produced, like that you can specify that there is a one object produced another Kubernetes object. And Argo CD leverages this native way to visualize the tree uh, resource hierarchy. But in some cases, you do not want to specify that relationship explicitly, but the relationship still exists. And we want to introduce a configuration uh, in Argo CD so that it can inspect maybe things like labels or annotations on the object and infer that relationship and visualize it in UI. And this is it, end of uh, my slides. And thank you. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Jesse, and I've been working on the Argo project also with Alex for five, six years now. Um, and I'll be giving an update on the Argo rollouts. Um, so first, some statistics. Um, so we're at 1,700 stars, and I'm happy to say we surpassed uh, Argo events recently. So <laughs> it's 40%. Uh, I mean, it's not a competition, but <laughs> we're, we're not last. So, um, so yeah, it's a 40% year over year increase. So it's, I think it's a healthy um, you know, increase. Um, this year we've done two uh, major releases of 1.2 and a 1.3. Uh, 
uh, release, which I'll be going over. Um, and that included uh, 36 new features and 66 bug fixes. Uh, uh, and in terms of contributors, uh, we have a total of 96 and 16 of them uh, contributed for the first time uh, this year. All right, um, so I wanted to see. Um, so one that two actually released a few months ago, but I thought it might be useful to kind of remind people what that was about because I'm not, I have a feeling not everyone is following um, rollouts as much. Um, so I'll quickly go through one or two before getting to one or three and then the roadmap. Um, so one or two introduced um, something called a dry run for analysis. So one of the things we're trying to do with rollouts is uh, to enable people to get started better. And so one of the problems uh, people face going to rollouts is that, hey, I don't trust my metrics just yet to um, gate my releases. Um, so let me practice with some uh, dry runs. So you do have the ability in rollouts to uh, mark an analysis as um, just let it run, but don't, if it fails, um, just you know, show that it failed, but don't actually um, abort the release. Um, so that's an uh, analysis dry run. Um, weighted experiment steps is a feature. Um, if you are running an experiment step in your rollout for the purposes of um, baseline versus canary comparison, so it's it's a slightly different um, canarying than just uh, traffic split. But basically, up until this release, we didn't have the ability to actually leverage the um, traffic routers like Istio, for example, to actually do like a, a three-way percentage-based split between like they say 5% to the canary, 5% to the baseline, and then 90% to your um, your existing production workload. Um, and the reason you want to do this baseline versus canary is to um, have an apples to apples comparison of your canary and baseline. And, and you get that because the canary and baseline will start at the same time and um, that way, all your metrics are um, are equal or, or comparable. Uh, so that's available. Um, ping pong service management. If you are, this mainly applies to ALB. Uh, so if you are using AWS load balancer uh, controller, one of the challenges with that um, their implementation is that they don't like it when you change the service selectors from underneath the controller um, because you can't take advantage of pod readiness gates in the controller. So, um, and we, we've we implemented like workarounds around that problem through um, just actually talking, making AWS API calls to um, kind of verify like, hey, did my, my weight actually take effect? So what this feature is about ping pong service management is that, um, we actually shift, the reason why it's called ping pong is because we shift the weight um, back and forth to the two services so that we're never changing the service selectors of the um, service at an inopportune time. Uh, and so this is compatible with the way AWS load balancer controller works. It's, it's uh, what um, something the AWS team recommended um, in, in the issue to, to to do instead of like changing service selectors. And that, and that just applies in general with AWS load balancer control. Just know that um, they don't like it if you just um, ch change the target of a, um, a service. Um, and then we also added app mesh uh, support in AWS and high availability is, and, and some scalability performance improvements. And those all came earlier this year. Okay, so let's talk about what just released today, uh, one not three, um, and so there are two things that we've been talking about for years: um, header-based routing and uh, traffic mirroring. And then, so if you are using like a, a more advanced traffic router, um, namely Istio, um, is the one we um, only support today. But you can actually leverage their capabilities for doing something like a, a header-based. Uh, routing. So what this is, is um, with typical Argo rollouts, you can do percentage-based um, before this, but now um, there's a new canary step uh, where you can say, 
based on this um, HTTP header, send all the traffic to the canary. And so um, this, you know, maybe if you need to have some stickiness uh, while you're canarying rather than just some random percentage basis distribution, uh, this will let you do that. Um, I don't know, maybe you want all your Firefox users to, to get the new version or something weird like that. Uh, but that's now possible with the header base routing. Um, similarly, uh, traffic mirroring is uh, a feature available in Istio where you can shadow your traffic to um, another service, in this case, the Canary. And um, it will it's mainly used for read requests, so it won't shadow uh, your, your puts and posts. But for like gets and stuff, you can kind of see how your Canary is behaving by um, mirroring the traffic uh, to the, that service. Um, we added support for traffic. Um, so if you're using the, the traffic as your ingress um, for rollouts, you'll have native first class support in rollouts. Uh, and the, there's some improvements to the UI, the rollouts dashboard, uh, where you can expand the canary steps. Um, so um, previously, you can only see like what the percentage had shifted, but there's actually some more details um, that that you can show in there. Uh, and the other improvement to the UI was um, uh, analysis. When you hover over some of the analysis failures or uh, successes, you can see um, some tool tips about like what actually, um, how it failed. Um, and, oh, InflexDB was added as a first class support. Uh, but I think the thing that excites me the most about this whole list is actually the last one. It's not actually a rollouts 1.3 um, feature. It's actually um, a, a new uh, repo, a new project uh, that was created to, to have better native support for customize. So customize is, is actually quite challenging to get it to patch the way you expect it to. Uh, and there's, um, if now you can just add a line of inside your customization to reference a um, open API spec. And you should now get kind of the, the same style of patching that you enjoy with deployments, but with a rollout. Um, so that's something that has uh, actually took a a lot of work to get um, right, but um, th thanks to Zach for um, leading this effort. Um, all right. Um, in terms of like what I think is um, important for the uh, for rollouts next, I think we're we've been accumulating a lot of uh, backlog on issues and uh, probably a lot of PRs to get to, and so. Um, I think it we're due for a hygiene slash maintenance release to kind of catch up on this. So, uh, we, at least in my opinion, I think we're a little overdue for just kind of uh, catch up. The, and then the number one probably upvoted issue has been to add authentication to the dashboard. And I've actually kind of been resisting this because the dashboard has always been this um, actually started out as a um, just a local host interface to kind of view a rollout if you had a cube context to your namespace. And um, that's kind of how it started. And that's how we just thought um, it would uh, exist. But then people asked for, oh, I would like to run this um, you know, as a hosted service in my environment. And so, so then we said, OK, that's not too hard. It's, all you need to do is like add um, package in an image and and um, and create some manifest for people. And then, so now people are asking, okay, I'm running it, but then now anyone who can get to the UI can like you know abort or roll out, promote it, and do whatever they want. So um, I think there might be some ways we can try to um, add a lightweight auth without going full blown like we did with Argo CD or um, Workflows, but I think it's 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 definitely a the number one popular issue in Rolla. So it's we actually we should explore what it um, should take. Um, oh, uh, Gateway API is if you 
are following uh, what's happening in Kubernetes. Uh, they are introducing new, uh, they, they often refer to it as Ingress V2. It's like a, a new standard for specifying um, Ingress. Um, and pretty much all of the major Ingress providers are, are on board and are providing an impl um, implementation that supports it. And so if rollout supports it, and it will, because there's already um, a PR for it, um, it means we can get a lot of Ingress support for free. Uh, so Contour, Kong, Kuma are all uh, Ingress controllers that actually um, uh, support the Gateway API. And so by just, hopefully, if we implement this, it'll be kind of the last of the um, integration, first class integrations we ever have to do, because then, then we'll ask, uh, you know, the other, we'll expect that the other Ingress controllers can implement the standard. Um, and the last one is um, better enablement. So uh, I mentioned this actually last year, but I think one of the challenges with rollouts is just, just getting started. And um, we could do a lot better in terms of, uh, you know, things like documentation, uh, how-to guides, um, providing just example templates for, you know, the well-known uh, metric providers. So I, I think if we could do, you know, just uh, some some of these uh, easy like guides and stuff, it, we could get better adoption. Um, one thing that's not mentioned here is I do think also you tools like utilities that help people convert or migrate uh, to a rollout. Um, would go a long way to to help adoption as well. And I think, yeah, that's um, all I had for rollouts. So, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Saravanan Balasubramanian, Alex Bala. I'm software engineer in Intuit and co-lead for Argo Workflow project. I have been working in the Argo Workflow project for past four years. Let's go to the summary of 2022. So we are reaching 12,000 stars. This year we got like a 2,000 stars. So please go get a star if you haven't done that. So it will help us to reach 12,000. And we have like a 600 plus contributors and we got like a 180 new contributors this year. And we implemented 121 features this year and fixed 250 bucks, so less bucks. And uh, we have like a totally 1800, 1800 commits. And uh, we, done, we done a, like a two major release this year. Let's go to the release. The 3.3 was released a few months back. Just I like to touch base, like uh, what are the major feature we had in that one. The one is like a lifecycle hooks, which will help the user to integrate with the notification and monitoring system for the workflow lifecycle. So if they want to integrate the Slack or PagerDuty for the workflow lifecycle, they can use that lifecycle hook. The second one is like a plugin. The plugin will give, give the user to extend that Argo workflow to define their own templates, which is a very powerful feature, which was released in the 3.3. And we have like a, some of the open source plugins in our GitHub lab for the Slack integration, Python integration and all the things. Please go ahead and uh, take a look. Then another one use case is like, if, if, you, if your organization has a, like a proprietary functionality, which cannot be open source, but you want it in that Argo workflow, you can develop as a plugin. The third one is like a multi-tenant support for SSO RBAC. So in the 3.2, Argo UI will support like a centralized cluster level RBACs. So 3.3 is enable, you can configure the namespace level RBACs for the Argo UI. Let's go to the 3.4. This is the one we released today. So 3.4, we are mainly focused on that artifact management. It comes with the two, two enhancements. One is like artifact visualization. Another one is artifact GC. The artifact visualization is enabling to 
display the content in that Argo UI. So the user can directly see that artifact contents in that Argo UI. I just uh, put a snapshot in that so they, it can show that the image, which is the artifact generated by one of the workflow step, they can, when, when they click it, they can immediately see it in that UI. They don't need to go to that any cloud storage or anything. The second one is like a artifact garbage collections. So another problem user is facing like uh, to cleaning up that artifact, which is generated by workforce. So we implemented artifact garbage collection so that user can define the strategy in that workflow when they want to delete the artifacts. So whether in the workflow completion or workflow deletion, there is a two strategy was available now. So then Argo controller will automatically go get and clean up that artifacts, whatever the artifact repository they configure. The second one, the Argo workflow was completed that security audit by ADA logics. So it's everything's compiled with the CNCF uh, security norms. The third one, we enabled that Azure block storage for that artifacts. These are the main features we released for the 3.4. Let's go to the roadmap. So th these are the roadmap. So mainly in the 3.5, we like to step back, uh, clean up our backlogs of bugs and establish that what are the features so far we developed. So giving a little bit time to the community to start using the new features, find a few bugs so we can help to fix those bugs. And we have like a few tech depths. So we are like to complete those all the things in 3.5. And 3.6, still the multi-cluster workflow is the top demand on the open source community. Yeah. So we have a POC done with Alex Collin. So still we are trying to find like a, a real use case from the community and trying to get a community contribution on that multi-cluster side. I think that's it from my side. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second ArgoCon. My name is Derek Wang. I'm a software engineer working at Intuit. I'm also a lead engineer in the Argo events uh, open source community. Uh, can everybody hear me well? Yeah, okay. Uh, today I'm gonna give you a maintenance update so that you could have an idea about what we are being working on. Uh, I would like to start with the project review to see what we have achieved in the past nine months since last ArgoCon. We had two major releases, uh, 106 and 107, and which contain 42 new features and 70 bug fixes. And there were 197 commits in total. You know, all of this were down by 56 contributors. And our GitHub stars uh, grew from 1,200 to 1,600, which is about 32% increase. And we're now like 40 stars behind Argo Rodolfo. So, <laughs> so please go start if you haven't. Um, about features. Uh, one of the most important features we have with the past releases is like we had a new event bus uh, implementation which is based on JetStream. Uh, JetStream is a product from another um, CNCF project, NAS. And the reason we had this JSRM event bus is because um, our original event bus uh, implementation, which is also based on <laughs> another NAS product uh, named NAS streaming, uh, and that is going to be end of life in 2023. So we had the JSRM as a replacement. Another reason for this JSRM event bus is um, JSRM is not only a persistable uh, messaging system, but also pro provides some other fancy features, uh, such as key value store. So we leverage this Kivalo store to eliminate some of the you know, restrictions we previously had with uh, NAS streaming event bus. That makes Argo events even more powerful. Another nice feature we had is the event source filtering. 
and that's a great supplement to our existing sensor filtering features. And then uh, with this feature, you have the ability to filter out those messages you are not interested in at the source, uh, event source level, so that you can reduce the messages coming to the system. We also enhance the sensor filtering features. We're now supporting more logic operators. Uh, you can now use N or, or any combination of these N or operators to do your filtering. And also we support Lua script. You can use Lua script to write your filtering logic. Our um, supported event source family has also improved a lot. We're now supporting Bitbucket Cloud and Bitbucket Server uh, event sources. With existing GitHub and GitHub event source, uh, you can use our events to do any GitOps with uh, all the popular source code management tools. We are also supporting uh, Reddit, Reddit stream event source. Event transformation feature is uh, another uh, amazing one. That gives you a chance to, uh, to transform the, the event you received before it passed as a parameter to your downstream uh, trigger like workflows or Lambda stuff. And trigger condition reset, that's another uh, nice feature. It's widely used by into the batch processing platform. Uh, give you a chance to uh, reset the unfinished con conditions you know, based on some cron or in timing you know, setup stuff. In terms of uh, the controller deployment, uh, we combine, uh, we, originally, we originally have uh, had like three different deployments for the installation. Even bus controller, uh, sensor controller, even source controller, we now combine all of those three into one uh, controller manager deployment. And we also enable HA for it. So that will simplify your installation process. Uh, security enhancement. We did um, another round of a security audit, which was conducted by Ada Logics and sponsored by CNCF and facilitated by OSTI. Uh, there are several uh, vulnerabilities at this and The good thing is we finished, we fixed everything. <laughs> we also published two uh, advisories. Um, so if you haven't upgraded to the latest Argo events, please do so. That makes Argo events no more secure. Going forward, uh, let's see what are the items in our roadmap. First thing you want to do um, in our events, we're gonna, uh, we want to enhance the feature of a multi event source in, in trigger support. Today, um, in our events, you can put multiple events configuration in one event source object. Event source is the starting object, to, uh, which defines you know, what kind of events you want to watch uh, from the external. Uh, you can put a uh, Kafka event source and, for example, a SQL event source in one event source object so that uh, we only start one pod or one set, one set of pods to watch the external events that just like, reduce your you know, resource. And similarly, you can do um, multiple triggers in one sensor object that also reduce the resource you're gonna use, right? But there's one issue with it. Um, every time you have a spec change on your events or your sensor, um, there's gonna be a pod restart to load the latest specification. So, um, if you only have one single event in, in the event source object, so you're expecting, you know, there's a restart, that's okay for you, but if you do multiple event source in one um, CRD object, and for example, I make some change to uh, the Kappa config, but it's unfair to the SQL event source, say, hey, why do you restart my service, right? <laughs> so uh, we are trying to figure out is a, a way to do hot reloading without, you know, just to reduce the power restart times. That's one thing. Um, the other thing is about um, the error or failure reporting mechanism. Let's say if you only have one event configured in, in one event source object, and then uh, let's say the Kafka, and you have a wrong um, broker URL configured, so it's expected that you know the the, the Kafka events or watching service will not be uh, running correctly, and you will end up with either a pod crash or some you know, error status in the CRD object, even for CRD object. So as an owner, you can quickly um, you know, know there's an issue with it and fix it. But with multi event uh, source configuring one CRD object, uh, let's, let's still use the uh, SQS and Kafka example. Uh, if you have a wrong uh, Kafka broker URL configured, our current strategy is uh, we just uh, you know, error out the Kafka events and watching service and print, print out some logs. But for SQS watch, uh, events watching service, 
it's still gonna be running fine. So the pod will still be running status, and there's uh, you know, besides the locks you, you see in the in in the pod, and then there's nothing else to let you know. So we're trying to figure out a way to have a better um, you know error reporting mechanism so that as owner you can quickly uh, detect those errors. We also think about it to um, support loading the specification from other stores, you know, like config map or even database. Today, or do everything in the CRD object. Right? That's one, another thing we want to announce. Um, the other item is like we are trying to support, uh, figure out if it's a good way to support like dynamic event source. How do I understand that? Uh, I will give you a, you know, example use case, right? So. Today, if you have, ups, you have several upstream uh, services, they're publishing events to a um, single Kafka topic. And then to identify which upstream it is, we use a type, for example, we use a type in the, in the events, uh, uh, let's say type equal A, B, or C to identify which uh, upstream it is. And if you want to watch uh, those events, you're gonna set up uh, multiple event source objects uh, with like event source filter features, hey, um, Type equals A, or I'm going to create the uh, event source A and the event source B, um, watching type equals, equals B, right? And then you will end up with um, many event source object, uh, and then start a lot of connections connect to the Kafka topic. And if you have a new upstream added, let's say type equals, equals Z, and you you also need to add a you know new event source, give the field is a um, type equals Z. So that's something you're not going to happy. So uh, why don't we just uh, you know come up with one single event source, watching this, uh, that single topic, and then dynamically um, publish events to different categories based on the, the condition you specify, for example, based on the type. You know. So that's you know the dy dynamic event source feature uh, I'm thinking of. Uh, the last item in, on the on the list is about the tracing open telemetry support. Um, that's quite straightforward. As an event-driven system, you know, we want to have some traceability. Um, there's another item I didn't list in the in the in the roadmap. Is um, I'm thinking of, you know, um, not sure if it's a good idea to support uh, more event bus like Kafka. Uh, you know, uh, I know there are a lot of companies and they have managed the Kafka service. And they want they want to use the existing uh, Kafka service as an event bus. You know, so you don't need to start any. A resource in, in in your cluster, and then to reduce resource or get better support, you know, things like that. All right, I think that that's everything I have. I'm gonna hand it over to Eric. I think for the first time in tech conference history, we're actually ahead of time. Um, we were supposed to have a break at 10.30 to 10.45 before we break the workshop. So I'd say we take a break now and then we'll reconvene at 10.30 instead of 10.45. Is everyone okay with that? We have to get a little bit longer break, but then we'll get a bit more time for the workshop. And an update to what I said earlier this morning, we're actually gonna do workflows and events on that side. So CD and CD and rollouts will be from from here and there. So if you see the end roll up, that side. Workflow events on this side. Everyone cool with that? Well, there should be coffee. I think there's a bit of fruit outside. So feel free to go out, refresh yourself, come back in here at 10.30 and we'll kick off the workshop. Thanks everyone.